Hi, welcome to this workshop. My name is Heidi Schulz. I grew up in South America, primarily in Argentina, and have been living for 20 years in Germany where I work in human genetics. Today, I want to talk to you about depression, its causes and treatments. But before I begin, I wanted to let you know that all the material will be available. At the end of the presentation, you will see a web page address if you go there and type in your email around mid-september i will send you an email with a link to download this presentation so that if you want to read more or look at the original publications and so on you may do so as uh, at the bottom right corner i always have there references where I got the material, so you're welcome to send me your email address. Today we want to talk about depression, an ailment that affects more people maybe than what we think, because every one of us tries to look good and yeah, do so as everything would be fine. But the reality is that many people suffer with depression and not even important people, well-known, well-situated people uh, are spared of sometimes feeling a little bit depressed. I don't know if about three weeks ago you saw the headlines, Michelle Obama opens up about low-grade depression and just looking to see how she's going to cope with it. For example, exercising, which she says she was having a little hard time pushing herself to go out and exercise during Corona. So even she suffers depression and athletes who won Olympic medals, competed at the highest levels, they also feel depressed sometimes, especially after they've won and they reach their goals. And then comes the question, and now what? And how does it go on? And all this motivation and energy they had put on something, what are they going to do now? So again, a couple of weeks ago, a documentary led by Michael Phelps came out where different athletes talk about their problems and coping strategies with depression. So you're not alone and a lot of people, especially now with the particular situation we are living in this corona time, um, yeah, it affects a lot of us and we have to see what we can do to prevent or get better if we're feeling depressed. And even, yeah, we see it's something that's common in all countries, in some countries more, in some countries less. Here you see the official statistic for different European countries. In blue, that's the percentage of men suffering from depression. And in orange, it's women, so more women than men suffer depression. And there is a big difference between men and women, especially in Portugal. We have countries with very small numbers of reported depression, like Romania, and others with higher numbers, such as Ireland. We also see that there is a correlation between the chances of feeling depressed, depending on where you live. If you live out in the country or in a big city, with a higher risk for a big city, which is in bloom, and a lower risk if you live in the countryside. And even if you think, well, depression, maybe it's something that affects older people, actually, it affects also young people. Here, 15 to 24 years old. In green, you see the percentage that are at risk of suffering depression. And in blue, the ones that are suffering chronic depression. And we see that depending on the country, 
many times you have as many depressed young people as old, let's say 70 or years or older. So in those two age groups, you have about the same percentages of depressed people. So it's not something that uh, it's only when you get older that you can suffer depression, it can also affect younger people. So it's good to know what can we do about it. I mean, sometimes we have situations that push us to some limit and make, make us feel sad. What can we do to control risk that depression is the leading cause of disability worldwide? So it's important to see if we can do something about it. It affects our health in a way that's even greater on overall health than having arthritis or being diabetic. And it's something that affects not only people that are non-believers, it can also affect even spiritual leaders like Ellen White. You know that she had an accident when she was young and that left some health problems. She had some heart problems and so on. And sometimes because of these other health problems, she felt gloomy. And she wrote, oh, why is it that such gloom rests upon everything? Why can I not rise above this, this, this de depression of spirit? So you're not immune against depression just because you're active at church or you're involved or a leader. Still, you may feel sad and depressed. And actually, trying to find the cause of depression is not that easy. What you're seeing here is a depiction of the probability of someone having some type of disease. You see at the top autism, schizophrenia, and so on, which are uh, yeah, usual, but even more people have, have for example, a mutation that predisposes them to cancer, what you see as BRCA, and you see major depressive disorder. From all the diseases that are depicted there, it's the one with the lowest heritability. That means there is some genetic component that may predispose you to depression, but it's not such a big um, influence the genes if you're going to get depressed or not. And you also see that there is a red and green dots. That means that the green ones are the ones for which genes and mutations have been found so that we can, if we want to look at the causes and know if someone has a variant that predisposes him or her to that disease. In the case of major depressive disorder, there has been big and many studies and it's not been possible to pinpoint really the exact genetic causes for major depressive disorder. So it shows that it's a complex disorder and that it won't be so easy to pinpoint just one cause and get the perfect treatment for that one change. Again, twin studies with monozygotic and dizygotic twins show that in the case you share completely genetic material, the chances if one of them gets depressed that the other one will also be depressed is about 50%. If you have a dizygotic twin, it's 18%. And based on these numbers, you can calculate the heritability, which is 0.8. 39, which is what we saw on the previous graph. Depression is a clinically heterogeneous disorder. It involves, it has emotional, cognitive, and physical components, and it can manifest in different ways. Sometimes it's even 
so to say, silent. The person is suffering a depression, but those outside don't notice it because the person has what we call the smiling depression. I will come to this at the end. But you probably heard and recognize many of these symptoms, which can be more or less present in a person who's suffering depression. And actually, depression is not one entity. And maybe that's why it's hard to find the genetic causes. In one study, they investigated the gene expression in people who were depressed, in men and women. And they found that there are 706 genes in men 821 genes in women that are regulated in a different way compared to non-depressed people. But if you get this list of 700 and 800 and try to find how many genes are affected, are in common between men and women, there is only 21 genes that are in common, which means that probably we have two different pathological entities in men and women, and probably also in men and in women, we have different things going on. We call them all depression, but maybe it's like five different types of depression, which have different causes. That means it's hard to find the cause if you're putting everything together on the same bag and trying to find what's the origin men are more liable to suffer from persistent depression, whereas women, depression tends to be more episodic. So we uh, talked a little bit that there are some heritable factors, but it's not such a big proportion or it doesn't account for the biggest uh, piece of the pie respect to why people get depressed. We also have not naturally environmental factors. For example, now we could say, okay, we are kind of isolated. We can't do our social activities like we're used to and so on. That could also yeah, be influencing. And both of them can influence each other and lead to altered gene expression, which modifies the functioning of the brain and affects our mental health. You can imagine the genetics as having a bike and as long as you're on a smooth road it doesn't matter much which type of bike you have but if you have a trigger or something that goes a little bit wrong or makes the whole situation a little bit shaky for example, you're in an unpaved road, it's been raining, it's muddy, it's an ugly road, then you notice the difference of yeah, how are you going to cope with that. If you have a bike that's made for that terrain, then you're going to cope much better than if you have a normal bike. The same thing is with our background and all these factors that I've talked about. In normal situations, we maybe won't notice in yeah, which group we belong to or what's going on. But if we come to this road that's not so smooth, then it can show. And there are a number of factors involved in the pathogenesis of depression. We still don't know everything. We still have a lot to learn, actually. We know, for example, that the microbiome plays a role, immunity and stress, for example, as a trigger. For many years, there was a hypothesis or a theory that depression had to do with the amount of serotonin in the synapses and the reuptake and the concentration of serotonin in the synapse and so on. But newer studies are saying that that's probably not the real problem and what's really going on. So 
So if we look a little bit further, we see that there is an interplay between the stress response, our immune system, and the microbiome. If you haven't heard about the microbiome, it's the, yeah, it means that all the microorganisms that live in you, uh, which can include bacteria, fungi, viruses, and so on. We know more about the bacteria maybe than the other ones, but the other ones also play a role. And it's been shown that especially the type of microorganisms or microbiome that you have in your um, intestine uh, really could have a big role in many diseases, including uh, depression. So what we see is that the uh, axis, the hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal axis is thrown out of equilibrium, so to say. There is an increase inflammatory profile, there is altered or can be altered microbiota and so on in patients suffering depression. The question is also what happens first? Do you have an altered microbiota and that's why you get depressed or you get depressed and that alters your microbiota? Still um, a lot to learn in this sense. Like I said, there has been many studies trying to pinpoint the genetic causes of depression. Big studies, for example, one identified 44 independent regions in our genome that are related to depression. Six of them are shared with schizophrenia, but still none of them really explains a high percentage of cases of depressed people. And then when we have the environmental factors and most of the time a trigger factor. So the question was, how does stress and adversity increase a risk for depression? Is it that if you're exposed to a stressful situation or a bad situation that increases your yeah, chances of getting depressed? Or is it that the more events that you're exposed to, the higher the probability that you will become depressed? Or is it that if it's a recent event, let's say someone loved, died one month ago, is, does that mean that you have a higher risk of getting depressed than if the loved one died five years ago? Or is it when, is there a sensitive period when some bad event happened? And can that explain more uh, how stress leads to depression? Can that give an imprint, some kind of memory that predisposes you to depression? And for that, there was a quite big study with um, children of different ages and a number of factors were investigated and they found that really what happens in your early, very early childhood actually, uh, let's say between the birth and three years of life, that's that has a big impact on how the genes can be expressed and can be used in the brain. And that is one of the main factors that influences or predisposes you to depression. So what happens in the very early infancy? So from the four hypotheses, at the moment, the authors of this study say that actually the most important factor is when you were exposed to a stressful situation. Was it in this sensitive period, which is in very early childhood, 
that accounts more than if you suffered a lot of stressful situations when you were 20, 25 years old, or a very recent situation, and so on. And that's interesting. It, it, this has to do, and what they investigated uh, is related to how genes are turned on and off. I will talk about that on my next workshop in one week. It has to do with something called DNA methylation and how you can label and turn genes on and off. Clinical neuroimaging studies have revealed volumetric reductions of the hippocampus in depression. Thus, repeated and severe stress exposure, particularly during sensitive periods of neurodevelopment, promotes the reprogramming of the hippocampus, inducing long-lasting alterations that might determine if you're going to suffer depression, often in a sex-specific fashion. And it's interesting because we have um, quotes from Ellen White who says, too much importance cannot be placed on the early training of children. The lessons that the child learns during the first seven years of life have more to do with forming his character than all that it learns in future years. So this period of neuronal and brain plasticity in early childhood is so important. If I had really known how important it is when my children were still at that age window, I think I would have done a couple of things differently. So if you still don't have children or still have children in that age group, uh, invest all the time and wisdom that you can in, in doing good elections for your children. Mothers, be sure that you properly discipline your children during the first three years of their lives. Do not allow them to form their wishes and desires. The mother must be mind for her child. The first three years is the time in which to bend the tiny twig. Mothers should understand the importance of attaching the, in, to this period. It is then that the foundation is laid. Going back to our picture, we have the heritable factors, the environmental factors, and a trigger situation. And what we see here, especially what happens in the prenatal period, the early postnatal and childhood periods, they all leave imprints in our brains, which then together with other factors such as a dysfunction of the adrenal axis, our immune disease regulation, or in stressful situations, together uh, can manifest themselves as anxiety, depression, and so on. And how this stimuli translate into a, an elevated risk of depression is through the so-called epigenetic mechanisms, which I will explain next week. That what we experience in early childhood leaves an imprint in our brain was shown in experiment with flats. There's, it's been observed that there are some rats who when they have pups, they take a lot of time to like clean them, licking them. And when the little ones want to drink milk, the mother arches her back so that they're comfortable drinking the milk and so on. And there are other rats who don't show that much this type of behavior. So you can observe the rats and divide them into groups. And they question was, is this biological or why does this happen this way? It usually when this little one grows up, it behaves just like its mother and the same thing with this one. So they got a lot of rats pregnant, a lot of little ones were born, and then some of them were led to grow up and 
have their own children and they behave like their mothers. The, some other ones were sacrificed while they were still small. And it was investigated what differences can we see in their brains and the difference at the molecular level. Are there genes that they have like the same genes, but are there genes that are expressed differently, that are turned on and off in another way? And that was what they found, actually. They found that in the brains of the animals that had the more caring type of mother, they had a more expression of many genes, or many genes were differently turned on and off. And one gene that is quite important for our stress regulation, it was the one that had showed the bigger differences. It's called uh, the glucocorticoid receptor gene. I will explain it in one second. But they decided to repeat the whole thing. And after birth interchange, the pups and see what happened. So actually, even though this pup came from the high leaking arched back mother, when it grew up, it behaved like the adoptive mother. And when they looked at the gene expression, it had less quantity of this glucocorticoid receptor gene, even though its biological mother had a lot of expression of this gene. So that means what we experience or what the rats experience during infancy led to changes in their brain. So no new gene was created. It's not that a gene disappeared, but how the genes could be used changed. And reduced expression of the glucocorticoid receptor gene leads to increased corticosteroid zone in response to stress, reduced exploration, increased fearfulness, impairment in learning and memory, and reduced maternal behavior in females. There is a number of studies that followed up on this. Uh, studying what happens at different time points and also in different animals and humans. And this could be reproduced that there are changes at the brain level depending what you experience in childhood. It was also shown that even in grown up men, 45 years of age, you take blood from them and look in the blood, which genes are turned on and off. And you see that there are almost a thousand genes which are differently turned on and off in men who experienced childhood abuse compared to those that weren't abused as children. And there's also, it's been found that there is a relationship between the turning on and off of the serotonin transportal gene, which you heard that serotonin is one of the postulated uh, players in depression. And it's been shown that even in monozygotic twins don't have the same genes, there are differences between how much labeling turning on and off of this serotonin transportal gene is found and that also correlates with a big depressive inventory score. So there is a correlation if um, it's more methylated then uh, the person is more depressed, even though it has the same genes as the other one who doesn't have so many labels on top of the gene and has more expression. And since I've talked about childhood abuse and sexual abuse specifically, um, well, you may know because we hear it in the media often that sadly, uh, sexual abuse is quite common in women, one in four. But what's rarely talked about is the fact that one in six men also have suffered sexual abuse. 
it can be in different forms and different kinds, but it still leaves scars also in men. And men usually don't talk about it. Uh, men and women feel ashamed, feel guilty, feel a lot of pain, and especially men close up and rarely talk about it with anyone. Uh, on average, more than 35 years go by before a man talks to someone about the abuse he suffered. And that's not good for mental health because that creates a, you're having this um, thing that's bothering you, that's a, that's a heavy burden and you can't share it with anyone, you can't get rid of it. So I would advise any one of you who's suffered abuse, find someone who knows about how to treat or um, yeah, what kind of therapy can be followed and talk with someone, or if you don't know anyone, talk with someone to ask if they know someone who could help in such a situation. So you can find peace so that you can get rid of this burden, uh, let loose of this guilt that you've been carrying with you for which you are not responsible. You're not responsible. You should not have to feel guilty about what happened to you because the other person is the one who was responsible. So I pray for you that you will find someone with whom you can talk about this and get the help you need. Depression is just what you see on the outside, but of course there are root causes and probably these root causes lead to changes, for example, metabolic imbalances, inflammation, dysbiosis, and so on. And they can influence each other. So it's good to treat depression, but maybe it's better to go farther down and deeper to find the real root cause and, and try to solve that first or at the same time. One way in which you can prevent or help a depression treatment is with exercise, for example. When we have a lot of stress, some of the pathways that um, yeah, are necessary uh, to fu should function in a one way, function a little bit in another way. So there is um, a greater amount of a substance called kynodin that's produced in the liver and this substance can get through the blood brain barrier get into your brain and there it influences what's going on in the cells and plays a role in in, in triggering so to say a depression if you exercise when you exercise you will be turning on a gene because you will be taking off this label that was silencing this PGC1 alpha 1 gene. And this gene encodes for an enzyme which adds an acidic group to the kinorine. And now you have this acidic kinorine which is too big to go through the blood brain barrier. So you have stress you that may predispose you to become depressed but if you're exercising then uh, you're leveling off that stress and preventing depression so stress is one of the things that plays a role in depression but inflammation is another very big factor which is not usually at rest in a antidepressive therapy or a treatment. Uh, while it is unlikely that major depressive disorder is a primary and purely and only inflammatory disease, evidence is accumulating to show that depressive and inflammation 
are closely connected and may fuel each other. Uh, for example, patients that for whatever reason have inflammatory diseases are more likely to have depression. And also one third of patients with major depression have higher levels of inflammatory biomarkers, even if they don't have any other disease. On the other hand, patients treated with cytokines are at increased risk for developing depression. So we see that there is an interplay and there is a number of illnesses, including diabetes, metabolic syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, asthma, multiple sclerosis, cardiovascular disease, chronic pain, psoriasis, et cetera, that are characterized by increased risk for depression. So what causes inflammation? There's a number of things. For example, even obesity uh, increases the amount of inflammation going on in, in the body. And once this process begins, certain cell types are going to be producing and, and giving off what we call cytokines, which are chemical molecules that are pro-inflammatory interleukin-1, 6, and so on. And these molecules can reach the brain and have an effect on the brain. And so a number of different things start to take place. Some people may become anxious. Others may experience anhedonia, which is a reduced motivation or ability to experience pleasure. But there, there you start having these uh, symptoms of depression. Depressed persons have 30% more inflammation in brain as controls. So it is important also if you're getting a therapy, a clinical therapy for uh, depression, to also try to see if you're not in a state of um, higher inflammation. Because even if you're taking some drug, antidepressant or whatever, it will not work as well or as fast if you have an inflammatory process. So it's good to consider also in even selecting um, patients who will be treated, deciding if first the inflammation will be treated and then start with antidepressants or at the same time, so um, the therapy will work more. And of course, you can implement lifestyle therapies like exercise, sleep hygiene, and so on, so that you reach an equilibrium. The other thing that can happen is that you know, in the intestine, it's not the, the intestine wall is not as healthy as it should be, that it becomes what is called a little bit leaky, and then that things that shouldn't get in in the body, or that some bacteria start producing what they shouldn't be producing, and so on. And these things can also yeah, lead to different processes, uh, like the systemic inflammation. A leaky gut can manifest itself in different forms. It can be skin problems, it can be arthritis or joint pains, it can influence thyroid function, and it can also manifest itself in different brain processes and trigger it or contribute to depression, anxiety, hyperactivity, and so on. Again, here we see a diagram of what's going on in this whole processes and how some of these cytokines can go directly to the brain or through the nerves influence what message is getting to the brain. Neuroinflammation is then a factor to consider 
um, when patients or depressive patients have characteristic alterations in some type of cells that we find in the brain, which are the microglia. Uh, so there's an increased number of immune signaling molecules, which we call the cytokines. And in the hippocampus, we see a, which has a high density of microglia. Uh, we see that the patients have smaller hippocampal volumes than healthy controls. And the question again is, does depression cause inflammation or does inflammation cause depression? And that's the big question. Um, heart attack patients have a rate of suffering depression, the depression that is three times higher than people who haven't had a heart attack. And that also has to do with what's going on in the body and the repair processes and so on. So they have a, a degree of inflammation which activates the microglia, which produce these interleukins and cytokines, which act on the brain, the hypothalamus, which then uh, regulates the amount of cortisol that is produced and so on. And there is a feedback also in the, the metabolism of tryptophan and uh, serotonin and tryptophan and the production of this quinoneric acid, which I talked about before. One expert in psychoneuroimmunology from the University of Munich states that he thinks that at least 40% of persons with depression have signs of inflammation. So it's time to address this. And even the American Journal of Psychiatry stated that it is both compelling and daunting to consider that dietary intervention at an individual or population level could have reduced rates of psychiatric disorders. Psychiatry is at an important juncture with the current pharmacologically focused model having achieved modest benefits in addressing the burden of poor mental health worldwide. Although the determinants of mental health are complex, the emerging and compelling evidence for nutrition as a crucial factor in the high prevalence and incidence of mental disorder suggests that diet is as important to psychiatry as it is to cardiology, endocrinology, and gastroenterology. So let's have a look at what has been found out about the role of nutrition and diets and what happens in depression. In one study with postmenopausal women, 87,000 of them, so it's a big study, they were followed for three years and the, their diet was also evaluated, how much fiber, the amount of vegetables, fruits, and sugar they consumed were all tracked. And it was seen that the alteration of becoming depressed during these three years had a relation to eating less fiber, less vegetables and fruits. Of course, if you eat less vegetables and fruits, you have less fiber, and consuming higher amounts of sugar. So the risk uh, was halved. So if the woman ate a lot of at least 20 grams of fiber per day, her risk of becoming depressed was 40% less than if the woman um, ate just 10 grams of fiber per day. Another study done in Spain with 15,000 students during a period of 10 years, so quite a long period of time, showed that students who ate a more Mediterranean diet uh, had less depression. So you see in this curve, again, the chances of becoming depressed and we see that there is, seems to be an optimal amount of Mediterranean or um, pearl vegetarian diet, which protects us uh, uh, 
from depression and reduces the chances from 100% if you yeah, use that as a starting point to 25%. So a factor of four reduction depending on the type of diet that you eat. And this was done with young people. Another study in which they evaluated if doing some diet intervention could help. In this case, the patients were divided into two groups and one of them received, they met together with a therapist and they got some recommendations and so on. That was this social support group. And the other group also met with a therapist, but the therapist was teaching them what foods could be beneficial for their treatment. And you see that after some time, the diet intervention group here in the column with the light gray color, the, their risk, their scores, their depression scores were reduced. And the more they followed the, the recommended diet on the right, we see the better their depression scores got. And another study showed the same thing, people who continue eating the same thing, there is no big changes in the, the how they're feeling. People who change their diet, uh, they saw an improvement after three weeks, which was maintained even at three months. So the further longitudinal studies and trials are needed to confirm several aspects, such as the link between depression and cardiometabolic conditions, we can conclude stating that there is a growing body of sound epidemiological evidence to support that food patterns with a high content in fruit and vegetables, olive oil, tree nuts, fish, and whole grains, but low in meats, meat products, commercial bakery, trans fats, sugary desserts and other sugar sweetened beverages are associated with a reduced risk of depression. So the question is, should the FDA or some different uh, societies here in Europe approve the Mediterranean diet for depression as a therapy? Should they be recognized as a possible therapy and maybe get a prescription <laughs> that you get fresh fruits and vegetables delivered to your house instead of pills? Could be. I mean, there is evidence that it helps. The problem is that in, I don't know, in other countries, but for example, in Germany, only 41% of Germans cover the recommended daily requirement of 250 grams of fruit and only 13% of citizens they have recommended 400 grams of vegetables. So there is a lot to do in, in this respect. I already talked a little bit about tryptophan and probably you've heard some people recommend if you're feeling depressed to eat more tryptophan, which is one amino acid. The thing is that um, there is a couple of amino acids that share the same way to get into the brain. So if you're going to be eating more tryptophan to prevent or help the treatment of the depression, then you should eat it with a carbohydrate-rich meal and not much other amino acids or other proteins so that all the um, doors to the brain are available for the tryptophan to get into the brain. And the other thing is to do sports, exercise, which also helps the tryptophan get yeah, in higher concentrations to the brain. What is the recommended amount of tryptophan to eat? It's not, uh, yeah determined exactly, it varies from person to person. So for someone who's 70 kilos, for example, it could be somewhere between 245 and 420 milligrams of tryptophan per day. 
But we should remember that not everything that we eat gets into the brain. It depends, like I said, on other factors. Now we come to the omega-3 and omega-6 oils. Uh, you've heard about the health benefits of omega-3, probably. And the fact that much of our processed food, what we eat nowadays, is much richer in omega-6 type of oil than omega-3. The optimal relationship between these should be one-to-one -one or at the highest, four times omega-6 to one time omega-3. And the thing is that we're way off of that ideal proportion. So what can be done? Increase uh, the amount of omega-3 that you're eating. So you can even buy omega-3 to take as a supplement. If you don't like fish extracts, nowadays there is also omega-3 extracts from algae, so it's even vegan. And that's one way you can take omega-3. Nowadays, like I said, the proportion is usually 15 to 1 in most of our diets instead of 1 to 1 to 4 to 1. So we have a lot of potential to do something in this area. We can also evaluate which types of oils we use. Flaxseed oil has a lot of omega-3 in relation to omega-6 uh, versus sunflower oil, which mean many people use, has a relation of 122 omega-6 to one omega-3. So maybe you can start eating more flaxseed oil. And yeah, with olive oil, we know olive oil is good for your health. Um, in this case, the proportion is also not that good. But um, yeah, we know from other studies that olive oil is good. A study in the Netherlands about depression and anxiety found that the higher the amount or the relation of omega-3 to omega-6, so the better this relationship was, the lesser the score of depression of the people. So there appears to be a relationship between how much omega-3 type of fatty acids you have and depression. Several other studies have also investigated this and with placebos and a therapy with omega-3 fatty acids. And they see, they all saw an improvement, a significant improvement in the Hamilton depression scores in people who took um, omega-3. So a higher change in the score means that the people got better during this study period. In another study with 60 major depressive depression patients who at the beginning of the study had a Hamilton depression score higher than 15, it was found that and they received either fluoxetine, which is a standard therapy for depression, a omega-3, one type of omega-3 fatty acid, or a combination of both. And you can see that fluoxetine worked, or the omega-3 worked as well as the fluoxetine, but with much less side effects. So, and if you combine fluoxetine plus omega-3, you had even a greater benefit of this combined therapy. And you don't have as many side effects. So it's worthwhile to consider taking omega-3. One source is also the chia seeds. They have three times more omega-3 than omega-6. And there the optimal intake is between 15 to 48 grams. And if you Google, you will find how you can prepare it or use it. It doesn't have any taste, so you can put it actually everywhere and you want 
even uh, taste anything different except for the texture. So maybe we can have a therapy, an antipasto therapy instead of an antidepressant therapy, according to these uh, newer findings, or maybe a combination of both that will lead to greater successes. If we're talking about inflammation, we can also think about eating or drinking uh, curcumin because um, it inhibits a lot of inflammatory processes and so on. So in rodents, for example, who are depressed, orally administered curcumin has been observed to significantly elevate brain monoamines and to reduce depressive-like behaviors. Oral administration of curcumin uh, in periods of high stress also had a positive effect on hippocampal neurogenesis and cognitive tasks. And eating curcumin in plants led to the elimination of traumatic memories and inhibition of uh, new traumatic memories. Treatment with curcumin is comparable to that of fluoxetine in alleviating depression in human clinical populations. And there you have the references. In another study that was done with three groups of 20 patients each, either with fluoxetine therapy, curcumin extract therapy, and a combination of both for six weeks, we see that the remission rate, so um, the percentage that got well, is about the same between the ones with fluoxetine therapy or the curcumin extract, and the combination of both potentiates the effect. Now we come to vitamin D and depression. Uh, vitamin D is a key, actually, pro-hormone or hormone um, that influences a lot of other processes. And what has been measured and seen is that people who have higher concentrations, so 50 nanomoles or greater of um, vitamin D in their blood, let's say they have a risk of one of being depressed. Those that have between 30 and 50, their um, probability of being depressed increases about 36%. And if they have a concentration less than 30 nanomoles per liter, then the chances of being depressed are more than double. And I can tell you that many of us are in the range of less than 30 because uh, between November and March, we cannot produce vitamin D even if we go outside when it's sunny in the few sunny days that we might have and at some latitudes because of the wavelength and so on. And it's not enough to make our skin produce vitamin D. So we should supplement vitamin D at least between November and March and probably the whole year round. And that will help our immune system, that will prevent and help in a treatment of depression. So um, yeah, there is a correlation between these values. And we know that vitamin D deficiency is associated with an increase of depression in of between eight to 14 percent. And a very interesting study was carried out at a clinic specialized for the treatment of depressed patients. And the building was in such a way that one side of the building got more sunlight than the other half. Here you can see pictures of how much light came in into rooms on one and the other side at different time points during the day. And you see that the southeast side got more sun. It was interesting to observe that patients that spent some time at this clinic, the ones that were sleeping on the northwest rooms had to stay longer than the ones staying in the southeast 
room. They had uh, about the same depression scores when they got to the clinic, so that doesn't explain the difference. When they went home, they also had similar scores and also their vitamin D levels at the end were approximately the same. The only difference was how much sunlight these people got because of, of the room that they were staying in. So that shows us the importance of also exposing ourselves to sunlight, being outside and doing activities and, and fresh air and so on. That's beneficial for our health. And sources of vitamin D are of course sunlight, some animal products, you have to know for yourself if you if it's better maybe just to stick with sunlight and supplements or if you're going to be eating animal products. Um, and the thing is that 91% of women and 82% of men in Germany do not have adequate vitamin D values. And even if you think in countries with a, where you think a lot of sun, Brazil, um, the continent of Africa, there you still see a lot of people with vitamin D deficiency because our whole lifestyle has gone from being outside to being inside and we're not exposed enough to sunlight to produce the necessary amounts. So let's go on to the third aspect, the microbiome, which I introduced before shortly. In a study, and to show you the degree which we would not have thought the, the, the influence that bacteria that live in us may have on how we feel, how we even our emotions have. There was one study in healthy people divided in two groups and they didn't know what they were going to get. One half got a placebo for 28 days, the other half got a product called ecologic barrier, which is composed of eight different strains of bacteria. And they measured at the beginning and at the end of the study, the aggressiveness and their rumination in these healthy people. So how aggressive they reacted to certain things and how much time or how many times a day they kept going back to some thoughts that were maybe not so beneficial for them. This is called rumination. And you see in the people who got the placebo, there wasn't any significant change in aggressiveness or rumination. On the other side, the people getting the bacteria, they were less aggressive and had less of this rumination thoughts. It, just because they were taking this bacteria, which they didn't, didn't even know if they were getting bacteria or not. So um, that shows that like it or not, the microorganisms influence how we feel and how we react. So we should make sure we're feeding them properly and eating enough foods that are good for the bacteria. There is a a lot of communication going on between our digestive system and the brain through, for example, the vagus nerve and 10% of the flow is from the brain to the digestive system, but 90% is going back from the digestive system to the brain. So that means what's happening in the intestine, for example, we are not conscious about what information it's sending to the brain but it is sending information. Ellen White said, the stomach is closely related to the brain and when the stomach is diseased, the nerve power is called from the brain to the aid of the weakened digestive organs. When these demands are too frequent, the brain becomes congested. So, so we should take care of our digestive system. And regarding Bacteria and microorganisms, one thing that can throw it off and, and yeah, make a lot of chaos is antibiotic treatment because you want to treat something with the antibiotic, but in the meantime, you also kill a lot of other good bacteria. And 
So in this study in Denmark, which followed the 1 million children and young people aged between 5 and 16, 17 years, they counted how many times these children or youngsters got prescribed antibiotics. And they saw that the more times they got prescribed antibiotics, the higher the chances that they would also at some point, maybe even a couple of years later, get a prescription for a psychotropic medication. So that hints that there is a correlation when I don't have the right bacteria or I killed all the bacteria, the good bacteria that my body needs to function properly. I come into a disbalance and that may show itself, manifest itself as a yeah, mental health condition. Regarding the amount of fiber that people eat and depression, it's been shown that if you eat less fiber, then the chances of being depressed are higher. <clears throat> And interestingly, if you take the fecal material of depressed human patients and give it to rats who don't have any microbiota themselves, you can, the rats that get the fecal material from the depressed patients, they also become or show characteristics of depressions. Um, anxiety, anhedonia, and even the tryptophan metabolism is changed. So this suggests that the gut microbiota may play a crucial role in the development of features of depression and may provide a target in the treatment and prevention of depression. A high fat diet is also something that should be considered. Uh, it alters, so it's not ideal for a healthy, good microbiome to eat a high-fat diet. So that should also be taken into account. So to have an optimal neurogenesis and a healthy brain balance, we should consider a diet, exercise, immune system, and a healthy microbiome. And on the other side of the scale, we have stress, cytokines, a, an aberrant immune system and this biotic microbiome. What we can do is try to eat a lot of probiotics or prebiotics. Probiotics are those foods that contain living microorganisms. Prebiotics do not have living organisms, but they have nutrients and substances which the good bacteria like and need. So you're feeding them, uh, if you're eating, for example, uh, leeks, onions, oats, banana are the most well-known from the things on this list. You're feeding good bacteria. And uh, treatments with prebiotics, so eating a lot of these things can help. In 45 healthy adults between 18 and 45 years of age, taking a prebiotic or a placebo every day for three weeks. What they saw is that when they were shown the negative and positive images on a computer and they were then asked how much negative and positive things they remember, um, those that had eaten the prebiotic, they retained, they remembered less the negative information and felt less anxious. Uh, also, the ones that took the prebiotics had lower levels of cortisol. Here you see a list of different bacterial strains and so on that have been shown to have an effect on mood. On the left side, in healthy human volunteers, on the right side, on people with depression. Summarizing, uh, negative life events may be perceived as an imminent threat, and that's why your body reacts. Uh, it may trigger an inflammatory state, and that, on the other hand, 
yeah, plays back and doesn't help um, us to get better. Gut bacteria and the host immune system act together in controlling and promoting each other's activity and that affects the brain-gut communication. So we can think about psychobiotic interventions which may protect us from the harmful psychological impacts caused by stress and so on. Adult hippocampal neurogenesis is a crucial brain process regulated by neuroinflammation, stress, and the microbiome composition. So, and it plays a key role in the theology of depression. That's why we should take care to eat balanced diet, which have been proven to help. And overall, depression is not an unholy trinity of alterations at the level of stress. It is an unholy trinity of alterations at the level of stress, inflammation, and the microbiome. Thus, any successful treatment should tackle all these aspects and not just treat the stress or a serotonin disbalance or whatever, but try to work on all these fronts. And like I said, maybe in in the church and yeah, yeah, where we work, where we are, you, even you or people in this um, places may look always happy and no matter what's going on they are smiling they go about life as if they would be well but there is a type of depression that is called a smiling depression which many people also suffer so you don't notice it so easily uh, people don't show their feelings or talk about them but inside they feel sadness. And it's just a facade, the smile and the external signs that they are showing. But inside, a, they feel anxiety, fear, anger, fatigue, as other people suffering depression. So also in these cases, we have to be sensible for people who may be suffering, who don't really show it, or if you are feeling like this, but always having your happy face on, also try to get better because on the long run, it's not good for you to be yeah, feeling like this the whole time. Where to get help? Yeah, we would naturally think maybe the church, but uh, yeah, sometimes it's not that easy to find someone who can help you in the church. <laughs> But we can keep trying and sometimes we feel some shame or don't know whom to ask for help. Again, Ellen White herself said that she concealed her troubled feelings from her family and friends, fearing that they could not understand her. This was a mistake, of course, she says. Had I opened my mind to my mother, she might have instructed, soothed and encouraged me. So she apparently suffered from depression at a very young age. And she herself says if she had seeked help at a younger age, maybe she would have gotten much better and it would have not troubled her for so long in her life. She counseled to go right along singing and making melody to God in your hearts, even when depressed by a sense of weight and sadness. I tell you as one who knows, she added, light will come, joy will be yours, and the mists and the clouds will be rolled back. So we have this promise. And if under any trying circumstances, men of spiritual power pressed beyond measure become discouraged and depressed, if at times they see nothing desirable in life that they should choose it, this is nothing strange or new. Those who standing in the forefront of the conflict are impelled by the Holy Spirit to do a special work will frequently feel a reaction when the pressure is removed. Depression may shake the most heroic faith and weaken the most steadfast will, but God understands and he still pities and loves. 
So we have this wonderful promise, God is with us. When depression settles upon the soul, it is no evidence that God has changed. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You are sure of the favor of God when you are sensible of the beams of the sun of righteousness. But if the clouds sweep over your soul, you must not feel that you are forsaken. Your faith must pierce the gloom. Your eye must be single and your whole body shall be full of light. The riches of the grace of Christ must be kept before the mind. Treasure up the lessons that his love provides. Let your faith be like Job's. Lay hold on the promise of your heavenly father and remember his former dealing with you and with his servants. For all things work together for good to them that love God. May God be with you, strengthen you, help you find the help that you need and give you joy again in your heart if you're feeling a little bit down or protect you and help you put into practice some preventive things so you won't get to this depressive state so that you can be instruments in his hands. God bless you, and if you want to receive a copy of the presentation, go to this address or to the URL, type in your email address, send it, and like I said, in a couple of weeks, because I'm on vacation, uh, I will send the presentation.